Hey guys, this is Tattoo Tony, and today we're going to explore this abandoned stadium. It's really amazing. There's some cool stuff that we find inside, and uh, the story about this place is really quite interesting, too. So make sure you stick with this. Um, you're going to see a lot of cool stuff, some spectacular views, and the video will actually be in two parts because there was so much uh, crazy stuff contained within rooms inside this Whoa. stadium that it warranted two videos. This is cooler than I thought, dude. Look. There's a medical table. Where? Maybe, but it's not very dangerous because it's not crumbling off. Somebody's been staying up here, bro. Yeah, get your pictures, dude. Hold on. We need to go. Go and go. We gotta get out there. It was like somebody was living here at one point. Hey, Andrew, come here real quick. Come here. Come up and get a picture. Yeah, 
Because I can come back down here and film. You know what I'm saying? Because I got this light, but even I can't. So here I am finding my way out and trying to work my way up into the stands. We will explore more of the inside of this stadium as well as another part of this, uh, another building full of stuff, part of this athletic complex or, or stadium, if you will, in the next part. So if you're new to the channel, make sure you like and subscribe. so you don't miss hey. the conclusion. In January of 1955, Mayor Peter Mandich pushed the city council for the construction of a sports complex. Mandich promised the council that if costs exceeded their ability to pay, the project would go no further. The council decided to go forward with the construction of a stadium as the first element. Funding construction to the tune of 350000 in bonds. Several weeks later, Mandich again appealed for funds to complete the stadium, stating, I'd, rather, I'd much rather not build a stadium if we're not going to build a decent one. That big hole, sinkhole, you'll see more of those and, and that'll be explained. Throughout the bidding process, city officials were given low-ball estimates to work with. Before long, it was discovered that 687000 was already awarded to independent contractors. Cost overruns continued to loom as construction wrapped up in 1956, and the final bill amounted to $1 million. If that's adjusted for inflation, that would be more than $8.5 million. To give you an idea, we'll compare this stadium cost to another sports facility built in the same era, and that'll help illustrate just how horrendous spending on the project had become. You just kept walking away from me. The ramp was cool. You were walking, and I was like, hey. Built in 1957 at the cost of 940000 Lambeau Field in Green Bay, Wisconsin used 11 tons of steel to complete an NFL caliber venue that could seat 32,000 fans. Okay, this was 800 and something thousand or it cost a million, I'm sorry, it wrapped up with construction cost of a million. But it was also built in a city that the steel industry defined, and it only used 630 tons of steel. Okay, Green Bay was 11,000 tons of steel, Lambeau Field. And this, this stadium here costs more than Lambeau Field, but it only used 630 tons. And it could only seat 10,000 fans. The NFL uh, Lambeau Field could seat 32,000 fans. This could only seat 10,000. They were built around the same time, and yet this stadium costs more to build. Citizens were understandably livid at having to foot the cost of a substandard facility. Plans to construct additional sports facilities came to a screeching halt. Despite the enormous amount of money poured into the football field, several features were never finished. Bleachers, concession stands, and restroom facilities to accommodate 
5,000 fans on the south side of the football field never materialized. So I was wondering at one point if there were more stands and facilities why it was just on this side. That's crazy. Look at this hole. Now there's shoddy construction and they cut corners. And if you were here and you could see how thin the concrete was, and usually you know concrete will be reinforced with steel or something in it, um, very like almost like chicken wire was in that concrete. It's it's insane. I mean you could see how poorly it was built. It was a it was a scam. Other accommodations that never saw the light of day would be staff offices, maintenance facilities, and an additional locker room. Gravel for an eight-lane running track surrounded the football field, was laid down, but never actually paved. The stadium took its name from local citizen Jack Gilroy. He had come to the area in 1911 and took a gym teacher position at Emerson High School, which we've explored, and that's on the channel. So if you haven't seen that, go watch it. The affable Gilroy rose to become the city's first athletic director four years later. By the time the stadium was complete and Gilroy ready to retire, the venue was named in his honor at the grand opening on September 1st, 1956. All eight area high schools participated in football-o-rama exhibition games. By 1962, the facade that Mandich had enthusiastically pitched just a few years earlier was beginning to literally fall apart. Building inspectors noted considerable cracking and moisture damage to the concrete supporting the bleachers. Scandal swirled around the field when, federal, when a federal investigation into six individuals involved with the project were convicted for kickbacks and bribes during development. Nothing more than a fresh coat of paint was used to put the concerns about construction to rest. Watch out. Between 1963 and 73, local schools found Gilroy facilities unable to meet their needs. Most decided it was in their best interest to construct their own facilities instead of paying rental fees, which hastened the decline of Gilroy Stadium. As the number of sporting events precipitously dwindled, city officials populated the schedule with alternative events. During the annual talent search in 1965, an upstart family act called the Jackson Five won their performance with their performance of Barefootin'. Their stunning performance garnered the group's first notable media mention in the local Gary Post Tribune. The Jackson Five would return to Gilroy Stadium again in 1968 but this time they were signed under the fame music label Motown Records. Over the next 30 years, the languishing facility would be used only intermittently. Anecdotal evidence says that the scoreboard has not been lit, lit since some point in the 1980s. Tower lights that went dark were no longer replaced. In 1994, concrete collapsed onto an electrical transformer which knocked out power and led to the cancellation of the Taste of Gary Festival. Functional out indoor plumbing only existed in the distant memories of those who knew the stadium in its prime. In between use, weeds would consistently reclaim the surrounding area. The beleaguered venue was once again embroiled in controversy I'm trying to think how to put this. There's a car that just made a second pass. Get a picture. Without having the, uh, 
whatever, you know, it's, you know what's going on. So anyways, controversy embroiled the venue once again. You know if anybody comes and you can hide. After the city granted the clan the right to hold an event in, at the stadium in 2001. On the day of the gathering, a crowd of protesters greatly outnumbered the 25 Man, we're up there pretty high. clan members in attendance. It was reported that the protesters were able to drown out what they were saying by singing, We Shall Overcome in Unison. Dude. I hope if you really, really, really watch my channel, you will know where that trouble game came from. And I hate to be rude, I didn't want to be rude, but you'll understand why I could not keep that. A vast majority of the events at the stadium have been significantly more benign in comparison. The field has been sporadically used for a variety of concerts, friendly competitions, and other public gatherings. Because the bleachers were wholly unfit for public use, a significantly smaller set was constructed to accommodate audiences. I'm going to hurry although, up and get to the stands before we lose our lighting, too. Although the stadium was worse for wear, the Gary Golden Bears semi-pro football team called it home for 15 years. In 2002, park development officials finally locked the gates and erected a no trespassing sign around the perimeter fence. Vines have taken root and are working their way up with a level of patience only found in nature. Steel, exposed to the elements, has succumbed to relentless oxidation. On the north side, a relatively new baseball diamond has been constructed, but even that shows signs of neglect, endemic to Gary. So in the 2000s, this baseball field was erected. Um, I like that word, erected. Oh, oh, I'm getting really scared. And it's already falling apart, so like, comment, subscribe, share. Love you guys, thanks. I'm in the spotlight, not until midnight.